I'd like to welcome you to our Tri-District uh, Professional Development Day. So nice to have everybody together. I'm Kelly Clenchy, Superintendent of Littleton Public Schools. I'm extremely excited about today's PD. This is our first pre-K through 12 Professional Development Day. About four years ago, Dr. Malone, Dr. Dwight, and myself met to discuss the possibility of sharing opportunities for professional development. We were interested in creating a platform that had its philosophical underpinnings aligned with the belief that some of the most effective PD is teacher-driven, designed to create opportunities for sustained connections and partnerships, focused on opportunities for discussion and collaboration, and is designed to create opportunities for sharing best and future practices. Two years ago, we dipped our toe in the water and offered a high school professional development day to our staffs. Last year, we expanded our target audience and offered a 6 through 12 PD day. Today, we are so excited to be offering a pre-K through 12 professional development day. This wouldn't have been possible without the hard work and commitment of our curriculum directors, assistant superintendents, curriculum coordinators, grade level team leaders, technology staff, and the involvement of teachers who were willing to share their expertise. Today's professional development begins with teacher talks given by three teachers within our school districts, followed by 27 individual breakout sessions. All of these sessions focus on a common theme, engaging students in deeper learning. We hope that you enjoy a wonderful day of learning, collaboration, and inspiration. At this time, I'd like to introduce our, our Littleton's Interim Director of Curriculum, Mrs. Steele, who will in turn introduce this morning's Teacher Talk presenters. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Conchi. It is truly my great pleasure to introduce the first Teacher Talk speaker this morning, Mrs. Heidi McGregor. Heidi is a natural-born educator. However, before officially entering the education field, Heidi worked in the tech industry for 15 years. When she did make the transition to education, she taught fourth grade for 10 years at Russell Street School here in Littleton. Just last year, Heidi trans transitioned into her current role as the K-5 STEM Integration Specialist. As a makerspace enthusiast and solid educator, she is always looking for ways to amplify student voice. Heidi is a connector of people, technology, and ideas within classrooms, across the state, and all over the world. In being a connector, Heidi co-found the Middlesex Scratch Meetups, leads the MassQ Makerspace Special Interest Group, and serves on the MassQ Board of Directors as well as the MassQ Professional Development Committee. Personally, I always love observing projects that Heidi has her hands in. Students and teachers alike are engaged in collaborative learning. She is incredibly motivated by her students and colleagues and how she can help provide a better, cooler, more unique educational experience for all. So without further ado, I introduce to all of you, Mrs. Heidi McGregor. All right. My working definition of student engagement goes something like this. Engagement is when students deeply internalize their learning experiences in a meaningful way that impacts their viewpoint and intrinsically motivates them to keep at it. It's not structured on compliance or going along without making waves or just being good. It's deeper than that. And as a teacher, I see my role as an influencer of student engagement and I willingly accept the challenge and the responsibility that that entails. I've thought about this at length and started shifting my thoughts to my own engagement in the education process. We as educators spend a lot of time focusing on student engagement, but our own engagement is equally as important. How can we possibly bring it if we're not feeling it? <laughs> I want to wake up in the morning and feel invested and passionate about the learning that's going to take place throughout the day. I want to feel like I'm making dif a difference and that what I do actually matters. 
I want to let my edgy awesomeness flag fly. <laughs> Maybe you do too. Now, don't get me wrong. There are many external factors that I can't control that affect my feelings of how engaged I am, both positive, like when the PTA comes by with the snack cart, <laughs> or when an administrator pops in with encouraging words, and negative. Let's not go there. <laughs> you all know what I'm talking about. But I can only control and influence what I can control and influence. By focusing on what's in my sphere of influence, I find that I can be more purposeful and intentional around my own engagement, which I believe in the long run will enhance the learning experiences of the students that I serve. I'm a big believer in the one word movement. You know, when you choose an anchor word and it guides your decisions and intentions for a full year, this year, my word is authentic, which is partly why I'm standing here sharing my truth with all of you. But last year, my word was connection. I wasn't sure where this would lead me, but I was inspired by the work of Brene Brown on this topic. And when I started building on this idea of connection and thinking back to past experiences, I started to recognize that the times when I felt more connected and was actually cultivating connections, I was more engaged with my own teaching. Now, don't get me wrong, ever since I started this profession about 14 years ago, being an educator has permeated my life. I walk my dog every morning and I lesson plan while I'm going down the road. I cannot go to Target without picking up something for my classroom or maker space. <laughs> I've even had trouble sleeping, thinking about students who might be struggling and how I could better help them out during the school day. But this idea of cultivating connections with joyful intention moved my concept of being an engaged educator to a whole new level. I'd even go so far as to say that the path to professional engagement is through cultivating connections like your hair is on fire. Now, in the interest of sharing my thoughts with you today, I've organized my ideas around connection into four realms. Self, students, other educators, and the world. <laughs> I have to start by sounding the trumpets on self-care. Without cultivating connections with my family and friends, I don't know how I could take on this all-consuming profession called teaching. I need my batteries charged and my chakras aligned. I'm not totally sure what chakras are, but you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I love my job even more when I know that my husband, my kids, my parents, my cousins, and my dog are with me on this journey. The next realm is my students. They are the cream in my coffee. The reason why I chose this profession. Building relationships with students has always been a priority, but so has growing their abilities as learners. As a classroom teacher, one of the things I struggled with the most was how to encourage students to read more at home, independently. Reading logs never really sat well with me, so over the years, I experimented with different activities to try to promote reading and basically hold students accountable. But the same thing always happened. The kids who loved to read did it in spite of my efforts, and the kids who didn't faked it. <laughs> I had one failed attempt after another, partly upon reflection because I wasn't looking at this problem through the lens of connection. 
Let me explain. A few years ago, I noticed something really interesting, and that is that my students, fourth graders, were talking about their favorite YouTubers. And some kids even went so far as to say they wanted to be famous YouTubers. So by being curious and listening and connecting with them, I started to see the allure, even though I didn't totally get it. Slowly, I started to wake up to the potential. What if I could nurture this and use it as a way to inspire more authentic reading experiences? Now, I had used YouTube before to post videos and find videos to use in class, but it never occurred to me on my own to start an actual YouTube channel to promote the love of books and reading with the world. <laughs> so together, as a connected community, my students and I made it happen by launching great book reviews. Months of getting to know each other through relationship and community building told me that I already had in my classroom passionate artists, musicians, performers, and readers. I used this knowledge to step back and invite the students to share their strengths and interests to make this project happen. One group of students designed a banner and a logo for our, our channel. Another group wrote an original uh, jingle for the start of our show. Um, and yet another musical group um, wrote a rap for when the credits rolled. <laughs> By just tuning in to their interests, I was energized to make this experience happen. The contrast between my former methods of at-home reading strategies that were disconnected from student interests was stark. The version that valued and nurtured connection didn't fizzle out. Instead, it ended up lasting for the next five months that were left in the school year. And it even led to several spin-off projects that we created together, including two bilingual episodes that aired in Spain. Independent reading increased, and quite honestly, so did my love for teaching. It was like when Dorothy realized that she had the power in her ruby red slippers all along. The connections were always there. I just had to tune into them with purpose and intention to make way for a transformative learning experience. Now looking beyond the students in my classroom, the next layer of connection is my talented colleagues who inspire me every day. I love walking down the halls of Russell Street and Shaker Lane schools and hearing the sounds of inspired teaching and learning. Or when a teacher mentions an idea for a STEM activity, that together we use as a springboard to craft a new learning experience. Or when a group of teachers gets together to go for a hike or to see a movie after school. Connections help us build something really great together. However, give me a thumbs up if this statement rings true to you. When I am teaching, I struggle to find time time to connect with other teachers in my building and beyond for meaningful collaboration and idea sharing. <laughs> so this is a great opportunity for me to make my pitch for why Twitter can help melt the walls away and give teachers more opportunities to connect. I can't tell you how inspiring it is when I see tweets from a Littleton High School teacher about strategies that they're using in their classroom. And sometimes I even catch a glimpse of a former student who I poured my heart and soul into. And when I see that he or she is still at it, I just want to double down on my <laughs> efforts at the elementary schools now that I can picture where they're headed. Or when I see a tweet from a kindergarten class trying out a STEM challenge with gusto, I feel so inspired to create more. Twitter also allows me to get inspiration from other educators not in my district. 
A recent example that pops to mind is when I was trying to build my own competence around a computer programming language called Scratch. Um, I joined, I started a, a, a group, we co-founded a group for Scratch meetups. And around that time, I happened to see a tweet from an educator in Waltham about a project that he did in Scratch with elementary school students. So on a whim, I messaged him to join our meetup group, and he did. His name is Zach. <laughs> he showed me how to use conditionals in Scratch programming, which we are currently using in our fourth grade to do projects on how to code choose your own adventure stories. Each time one of our fourth graders masters this skill, I feel like it's a victory for me, the student, and Zach. Then I tag him in a tweet so he can celebrate success with me, which he does. These online interactions go a long way to keep me inspired and engaged in what I do, even on the days when I don't have the good fortune of collaborating face to face. This leads me to one more confession. Global connections rock my world. <laughs> I figured this out about six years ago when I signed up for ePals and I was partnered with Mr. Potter from Collingwood, Ontario. We decided to team up for a shared science experiment on stimulus and response. This led to videos, emails, and several collaborated, uh, collaborative writing projects. Not only were my students pumped to collaborate with a classroom from another country, I was equally as pumped. <laughs> Being able to share an academic experience with the perspective of a skilled educator in another country brought me insights that I would never have had without that opportunity. Now, Mr. Potter has since retired, and over the years, I've reached out and found other global partners, and I plan to continue. Revisiting Brene Brown, she says that a connection is the energy that exists between two people when they feel seen, heard, and valued. When they can give and receive without judgment, and when they derive sustenance and strength from the relationship. I am a connected educator. I love my job. Connection is why we're here. I have big plans for more meaningful connections in my personal life, with students, with you, <laughs> and with the world. But how about you? How will you use the power of connection to continue to light your teacher fire? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Wow, how are we doing? Good morning, everyone. Much better. I'm Charlie Kaliri, the Assistant Superintendent for Air Shirley, and it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Uh, doing our next teacher talk is Courtney Powell. Courtney is a first grade teacher at our Laura White School, and I had the pleasure of meeting and getting to know Courtney over the past year with her involvement in our literacy leadership teams, our responsive literacy program, and also, most importantly, uh, through our Universal Design for Learning and our participation in our Inclusive Practices Academy. So Courtney is going to share a little bit about her mindset shift and the opportunities that she's had uh, to break down some barriers for her kids in the hopes that you all will take a little piece of how to break barriers for the rest of yours. Courtney. Good morning. We good? Yes. People often ask me why I chose the field of education. My answer, I would imagine, is very similar to yours. I love children. And while I, of course, love teaching and the subject content, it's really the kids that get us up every day here or even into our classrooms. I'm here today to talk about my journey as an educator, how my mind has shifted greatly in my approach for my students, and how to best meet all of our students' needs. 
I am passionate that all students are capable of learning, and I truly believe that we can achieve great things in our classrooms. My passion for equity is deep-rooted in who I am and starts with my family. I come from a, a family of people who struggle with dyslexia. These three men each had a unique, difficult journey to overcome their learning differences. I remember my father telling me stories of being in the slow class in elementary, middle, and even high school. Of course, he attended school in the 60s and 70s, so much of what we've done with special education students has changed, or so we hope. He's explained that the general feelings of the classrooms that he was in were that you were nothing. You weren't going to succeed, just get through the 45 minutes, and you're no longer my problem. He was secluded from his other friends. Isn't it a strange, self-fulfilling prophecy that many of the people that my father attended school with lived very difficult lives? Without my father's unflappable determination and work is never done attitude, his own life would have been very different. It was the struggles that I witnessed with my brothers and my father that inspired me to become a special education teacher. I vowed to break that cycle, and I thought I was doing just that. Prior to teaching at LAW, I worked at the Flack Educational Collaborative as a substantially separate autism spectrum disorders classroom teacher. I worked with students from K to 5 who presented with a variety of cognitive, behavioral, social, emotional, mental health, and even trauma-based disorders. It was a busy, rock and roll, dynamic classroom, but I loved those kids and I loved coming to work every day. Yes, I can was our motto. I fostered a strong belief that every child was capable of learning, and I fought for my students to have the same rights as their typically developing peers. I do believe that I made a difference with those students, but I know now that if I had been given the opportunity to teach again there, I would do things very differently. After teaching in sub-separate for seven years, I wanted to test the waters in the general education setting. I thought I would be the perfect addition to an elementary classroom. I knew how to teach every student. Within a year, I joined our district's inclusive practice team. We began a journey of universal design I told myself I would be perfect for this team. I, of course, knew how to do this. This was going to be a breeze. But I quickly realized what I was doing in my own classroom was exactly the opposite of what I had vowed to do. If a student in my first grade classroom struggled with addition, I gave them a number line. They struggled to write, I'd scribe for them or give them a template. I was allowing them to be successful. It was in my own journey, though, that I realized I was, in a way, no better than my father's teachers. When I follow a student and consistently pull them for a small group, I'm telling them that they can't do something. When I modify everything that they do or sit close to them, I'm telling them that they are unable. Maybe I don't say it out loud, but as six and seven-year-olds, they're already starting to categorize themselves as good or bad. It's that self-fulfilling prophecy. If I tell you you always need help, you will. It was through my journey that I began to understand the stark difference between what I was doing and what I could be doing. At the beginning, I identified what you needed in order to be successful. But now, I offer options that might help, and you choose what you need. You see, we're all less than in some areas of life and greater than in others. I would consider myself to be above average in understanding child development probably to about age 12. Once they get into those teenage years, not my thing. I've taken coursework, I've completed research, I've worked with diverse populations in both elementary and early childhood levels. Comparatively, I would consider myself way below average when it comes to my ability to fix things around the house. Last year, I owned a small condo, and the water heater was in the guest room up in the um, closet. I was putting away some winter clothes, and I realized the water heater was leaking. And by leaking, I mean gushing. Down the walls, 
all over my clothes, on the carpet. I was petrified it was going to leak through the floor below me, and I would have to pay for it. So I immediately did what we see all too often in our classrooms. I shut down. I cried. I yelled. I swore. Really great coping skills. But then I did exactly what those students who have labeled themselves as unable to do, do every day. I called for help. In this case, my father. I can't fix it, but he can. When I hung up the phone, I didn't even try to fix it. I just stood there. It was while I was driving to work the next morning that I realized something important. I'm not much different than those students in my classroom. I had told myself I was unable to do this, and therefore I was. So how did I change this in my classroom? I started very simply, and it's still a work in progress. In lieu of my typical means of teaching, I began to put ownership on the kids. It wasn't pretty at first. Like every skill, it took time and explicit teaching. I began to make my students self-reflective, even as six and seven-year-olds. After teaching a lesson, I asked the students to reflect on the concept at hand. How do you feel about that? Great? Okay? You need a little bit of review. Do you feel lost? Would you like to work with me again? Then I asked them to think about themselves as learners, to take ownership of their own learning. Now think about you. Do you learn best when you're with someone? By yourself? On the floor? Standing with manipulatives when you can draw? It was one of my students last year that I saw an immense change with in her ability to self-advocate and make independent choices. She was someone who struggled with a learning disability, and in her time in my classroom, she was picked up for an IEP. At the beginning of the year, I found myself following her through every center, sitting close to her, modifying her work, jumping in every time I saw a mistake. By the winter, I started to see a change in her. She was clearly feeling insecure, and she didn't want my help. But this went against everything I, as a teacher, knew was right for her. She struggles, so I have to help. Quickly became an issue for us both. I could feel both of us getting frustrated every day. I knew what she needed, but she didn't want it. But then I began my mind shift. Instead of telling her that she needed to do this specific task in this specific way, I began to let her and my other students make choices for themselves. It took a while, and like any skill, there were lots of bumps along the way. I don't get it. I can't do this. I need help. There were lots of things that I heard. But over time, I started to see a shift in their thinking their level of engagement, and their enjoyment in the classroom. Many of us have discussed, been trained in, or implemented growth mindset in the classroom. I thought I was doing it. You know, I talked about it with the kids. I read a book about it. I even made an anchor chart. But when I took a step back, I realized I wasn't actually giving kids the opportunity to do it to be challenged and grow their minds. I was jumping in every time they struggled. How could kids be engaged if I was the barrier to their learning? The little girl in my classroom often chose not to work with me. It gave her a sense of independence and pride to be without me with her peers. I remember one day she was working on a math problem and she totally set it up wrong and I was physically grabbing the chair not to go over to her. But then something amazing happened. She saw the problem, she fixed it, and she did it right. When we lower our standards for our struggling students, they stay there. When we jump in and we help our students every time they struggle, they become prompt dependent and helpless learners. It's our natural instinct as teachers to help. That's why we came here in the first place. But I realized through this journey that sometimes helping is causing the struggle to occur. 
By the end of the year, that student was able to identify areas where she needed help, and she asked for it. But most importantly, she knew what she was good at, and she saw herself as a confident learner. I challenge you today to think of your students as you think of yourself. There are many things that you are good at, and lots of things that you are not. It's our job as teachers to assist all of our students, young or old, typically developing or disabled, that they are responsible for their learning, they are capable of learning, and they have a role in their learning. It's a personal goal of mine to try and do more fix-it things around the house. Uh, will it be pretty? Absolutely not. It will probably cost me a lot of money to fix the mistakes along the way. But like my students, I know that I can only grow when I am challenged, and when I'm given the opportunity, I can achieve it. I leave you with this image. When a baby learns to walk, we expect them to fall along the way. When they do fall, they get up and they try again. They don't even really get too discouraged. Sometimes they need us to encourage or guide them, but we would never put a baby in a walker permanently because of a few falls. Sometimes we do this as teachers. We put kids in walkers. Let's change what we're doing. Let's give students the tools that they need in order to take those first scary steps. Some might need more, some might need a challenge, but we can lead all students to success. Thank you for your time. Can't think of a better subject to discuss on a professional development day than the importance of teacher engagement and the importance of meeting our needs as educators in order to meet the needs of our students. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing you to an amazing colleague of mine, Kristen McManus. After sharing a classroom with her at times and also co-teaching a course with her, I've come to know her very well. She is incredibly dedicated to the art of teaching and it shows in her command in the classroom, as well as her rapport with students. A teacher at Brownfield in the Social Studies Department since 2010, Kristen started in the middle school and currently works with junior and seniors at the high school level. She advises the Business Professionals of America Club, and she's also sought out and experienced some of the coolest professional development opportunities I've known any teacher to do. Without further ado, Please welcome Kristen McManus. Good morning. Good morning. I am actually a resident of Littleton, and so I see some of my own kids' teachers here. So shout out to the teachers at Shaker Lane School and the Russell Street School. But today I am here to talk to you about professional development, or PD. We all know that not all PD is created equal. Some we have to take because of licensure requirements, and it might not be something that we're incredibly interested in. Some we take because of district initiatives, or because it fulfills the requirements of a graduation program we are enrolled in. But today, I'm here to get you to start thinking of PD in a different way. Fair warning, I am a history teacher, <laughs> and as such, I love to tell stories. And I often teach my students as if I'm telling a story. So I'm going to start you off with one. I remember being 22 years old and first starting in this profession. I was an 8th grade U.S. history teacher and completely clueless about this thing that they called professional development. I had no idea how it related to my licensure or if it was even worth taking. So that first year, my school had enrolled in the Teaching for American History grant program and were offering week-long professional development in the summer. I kind of figured, well, hey, I teach American history. I should probably take that. So I signed up, and I must admit, I was probably way more interested in the stipend that it was going to provide, and perhaps the graduate credit that it was going to provide. And I say this without qualm, because I know we have all been there. <laughs> Money talks, especially when it's to a 22-year-old first-year teacher who is holding down three jobs and facing the first of her student loan payments. So, I signed up for this course in slavery in New England, and I was hooked. 
It satisfied me on two very basic levels. The first, my geeky, history-loving self. I locked that stuff right up. I couldn't get enough of it. And the second was that it actually taught me strategies and project ideas and lesson plans that I could bring in my classroom. I was so excited to get back in the classroom that I forgot that it was July and I had to wait another month. <laughs> so, from then on, I have consciously decided to approach professional development with two goals in mind. First, can the PD satisfy my geeky interests? Is it something I enjoy or is it something I know a little bit about and would like to know more about? I see myself as a professional student, so it all comes down to whether or not this PD opportunity will let me be a student and not just a teacher. And second, can it help me teach? Does it inspire me to teach? Does it give me strategies that I can use in my classroom? Does it inspire me to want to make lesson plans based on what I've learned? In my mind, and this is going purely from my own experience and no research whatsoever, these should be the two cornerstones of valuable professional development. One, can I learn something to satisfy my geeky interests? And two, will I learn useful things to implement in my classroom? I think it's important for us to see that there is a distinct connection between student engagement and teacher engagement. So let's take a little detour for a minute. If you think about the non-education world, an important part of managing your employees is making them happy. So let's think about some companies and the way in which they go about doing that. Some companies have you know, great holiday bonus plans, right? Or perhaps they have wonderful health benefits. Some companies have nap pods <laughs> for their employees to take a quick snooze in the middle of the day. Can you imagine nap pods? Be amazing. <laughs> Sometimes we see workplaces with free coffee, snacks. Sometimes we see workplaces with foosball tables or ping pong tables. But let's face it, we are teachers, right? Um, our health benefits are shrinking. We sure don't get nap pods. And we never get holiday bonuses. Because in our profession, that really just isn't the norm. So in the absence of these types of job perks, I have made it my goal to try to influence my own job happiness. Because my happiness as a teacher will directly impact my behavior in the classroom. And I should note, I look for free or cheap professional development opportunities as well. Those are the best kind. While I may not be able to take naps in the middle of the day, I can try my best to embark on opportunities that will engage me in the summertime, sustain me throughout the school year, and then make me look forward to something in the next summer as well. I am lucky enough to be part of a school community that is not only extremely supportive of professional development, but I am also part of a teacher community that has a huge amount of talent. To help illustrate my points, I am going to tell you a little bit about some of my own professional development opportunities and give you examples of some others as well. In the fall of 2016, I approached one of my colleagues, Elizabeth Horniman, who's an art teacher at our school. I found this cool thing, very randomly, where it was an organization called Fund for Teachers. They funded grant opportunities for teachers to create their own professional development experience. So if you want to take a trip, they will fund your flights, your lodging, your food, conference fees, and so on and so forth. So I took a step back and started thinking of my own dream professional development. For me, it would entail travel, and then it would entail something that I have always wanted to do. I had always wanted to go on an archaeological dig. I never had any aspirations of being Indiana Jones, but still, that was what I was thinking I wanted to do. And so, I started doing some research and found a few options, and the most appealing one was to go to Italy. Elizabeth and I sat down for many hours, wrote this grant, applied, and we got Straight up denied. <laughs> denied. And rightfully so. We did work hard on that grant, but it could have been better and it could have been lots more focused. And so we vowed that we were going to regroup and write again the next year. Perhaps you heard about an incident in that same fall of 2016. It happened at our school and it made the local news. 
Our school experienced an incident of vandalism on a rock that the students paint for school and team spirit. It's located right in the front yard of our school. There were symbols of hatred and discrimination graffitied all over it. In response, administration had a school assembly. They brought in diversity speakers. Teachers had lots of discussions about school culture and climate. The students formed their own groups, and there was a group, community group formed as well. But despite this, more hateful symbols were still showing up around our school. As a faculty, it was shocking to us to learn that students really didn't understand the significance and the seriousness of a swastika and other hateful symbols of discrimination. Since that time, it was clear that the teachers and the, and the administration, and the students really, need to work together to educate the students and foster a more positive school climate. So Elizabeth and I put these two things together. We realized that we could link cl uh, the school climate and negative symbols by studying ancient symbols. We went back to the drawing board and decided to write another Fund for Teachers grant. Our hope was that we would travel to the northern mountains of Italy, where we would study ancient rock art on an archaeological dig, and then we would travel down to Naples and go to Pompeii and the National Archaeological Museum to find out about what happened and what was left behind after the volcanic eruption at Pompeii. Our essential question guiding this was, how do symbols emerge from, define, and impact a culture? Our hope was to learn all that we could while we were in Italy and come back to school to engage the students and teachers in a community service learning project. We wanted to beautify a sort of run-down courtyard in our school by having a ceramic tile mural painted with all the students would paint their own tiles and with positive symbols of school community. So we reapplied and we got it. In the summer of 2018, we traveled to the northern Alps of Italy. We dug in the dirt, we listened to lectures, and we worked right next to some of the foremost experts in the rock art field. We helped to study, document, and even discover rock art that was 5,000 years old. We then traveled to Pompeii to see what the city had left behind after that volcanic eruption. This whole experience was once in a lifetime. We came back to school enthused and excited and got started by having teachers, students, and other teachers' classes as well paint the ceramic tiles. We enlisted the help of the garden club to make plans on taking out the plants in the courtyard. And we also applied for a Harvard School's Trust Grant to, to provide money for supplies. As of now, we are about 300 tiles in. We do still have about 500 more to go, but we hope to continue this project in the next year. So this trip helped to solidify my belief that professional development that is valuable needs to have these two major things. First, this totally met my geeky interests. And second, it inspired me to want to go back to my classroom and engage my students. So I figured, okay, let's try again. Let's look for another PD opportunity that could meet these two goals and test my theory out a little bit. So this past summer, I applied for the Supreme Court Institute. I should also note that this was my second time applying. I can't tell I'm persistent. Anyway, I was lucky enough to be accepted. I traveled to Washington, D.C., where I took classes with 29 other educators from across the country. We attended workshops at Georgetown Law and heard from law clerks who worked for Supreme Court justices attorneys who worked for the Department of Justice and the White House, and attorneys who had argued 20 plus times in front of the Supreme Court. I was able to sit in the Supreme Court and listen to four decisions handed down, and I was also super lucky to meet Justice Sonia Sotomayor. She took the time to talk to each one of us teachers, and I conversed with her about the state of civics education in Massachusetts and about our new social studies frameworks. Geeky interest? Totally check that box off. Check, check. <laughs> Strategies to implement in my classroom? Check. Without a doubt, check again. So I decided to further test my theory. I couldn't be the only one who's out there doing these types of things. I decided to reach out to other teachers in Bromfield to see if they ever had a PD opportunity that met these goals as well. 
I talked to Emily Varaki, who teaches 9th and 10th grade English at Bromfield. She told me about a course that she took with Research for Better Teaching. She said that she was literally sitting in the chair in the classroom and thinking about how she could implement these strategies that they were teaching her. Not only was the instructor engaging, but it was the best course that she took because it was applicable to her job in that moment. Lastly, I talked to Kathleen Doherty. Kathleen is the Social Studies Department Head at Bromfield and teaches 11th and 12th grade electives such as AP Psychology and Current Events. Kathleen has always made the events of September 11th an important part of her classroom curricula. She was a classroom teacher on that fateful day and has always incorporated student oral history projects as well as made bulletin boards with primary sources from the time. Two summers ago, she applied and was accepted into the Gilder Lerman Institute for American History. She went to the 9-11 Memorial and Museum in New York City and took classes with survivors, first responders, and victims of 9-11. She maintains that it was one of the best PD opportunities that she has ever experienced. She was engaged, she was eager to learn more, and she was eager to bring back what she learned to school. Later on that year, she organized a community event to hear from Captain Brenda Berkman. Captain Berkman was a New York City Fire Department and first responder on 9-11. I brought my own classes to hear Captain Berkman, those are a few of our students, and I was so thankful to Kathleen that she was so inspired by her PD to come back to school and to provide these opportunities to our students. To sum up, if we want to engage our students in the classroom, Teachers need to be engaged as well. We need to seek professional development opportunities that challenge our intellect and that teach us strategies to implement in the classroom. We all teach because we are passionate about kids, but also because we are passionate about the grades and the subjects that we teach as well. Therefore, we need to harness that passion, use it in our classroom, and inspire that passion I encourage you all to rethink your approach and seek out professional development opportunities that make you excited to learn and excited to engage students in your classroom. Thank you very much. There are so many additional thank yous that we really need to acknowledge. This day is a true collaboration from start to finish. So we would like to thank the teachers that will be presenting today. Thank you to senior Caitlin Boyer, who is in charge of sound and lights and general tech help for us today. She's in the back. Thank you, Caitlin. Also, thank you to Jacqueline Walker, a student from Harvard who made the poster for our, B our PD day today. <clears throat> Additionally, we would like to thank our student volunteers, who you will see throughout the day, throughout the building, helping us guide um, our visitors to various locations, including the green screen, which can be found in the library. So visit there if you have a chance. <clears throat> Many thanks to Fernando Fernandez, Dale Rector, and Tamara Hadley, and the entire maintenance crew for their help prior to today, during the day, and of course, after the PD is over today. Many thanks also go to John Overcash, Mary Lou DeVellis, and the entire cafeteria staff who have worked really hard to provide the re light refreshments this morning, as well as what will be our delicious lunch this afternoon. <laughs> also, thank you to LCTV for recording our teacher talks this morning. And lastly, I would like to thank the planning committee for today. As I mentioned earlier, today is a true collaboration, and I express the most sincere gratitude to Julie Lord, Natalie Croto, Bettina Coro, Beth Graham, Charlie Cleary, Dr. Clunchy, Dr. Malone, Malone excuse me, and Dr. Dwight. <laughs> and now I think we're all ready to stretch our legs. So we are ready to go out and begin the first breakout session. Thank you very much.